Well, this morning I want us to look at a passage of Scripture and uh, bear witness in 1 uh, Peter uh, chapter number 2, verses 9 through 12. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit different, and that is because I'm going to be coming back to this passage of Scripture. I'm not going to read it outright. Uh, we'll be covering every part of that, so I want you to be open to that Scripture, and we'll be dealing with it in the various ways that we need to. Uh, some of the areas, uh, because of time, I will kind of fast forward through. Uh, so I want you to listen as fast as you possibly can as we think about this particular message today and we think about the subject of impacting our world uh, for our graduates and for each of us that we understand that our job is to impact the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pray together. Father, take your word now, speak it to our hearts. Our hearts have been wonderfully prepared in this time of worship. Thank you, Lord, again for these graduates and the way your hand is upon them and how you're going to use them. Thank you for these young ladies and how you're going to use them on the mission field, home and abroad. And, Father, I pray also for parents, God, that you'll give them peace of heart and peace of mind as they send them forth into the world and on the mission field uh, to, that you will comfort their heart in knowing that there's never a place that you're not with them. And so, Lord, thank you for that great promise that you've given us all. Bless us now as we look at this passage of Scripture. Help us to think about this subject of impacting our world with the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as we think about this particular message today, and we began to think about uh, a lot of life. I know graduates that are here today, you certainly are looking back, thinking over those first days in school, and all of us think about having to say the Pledge of Allegiance all those years, and how we would pledge our allegiance to a nation. Nothing magical in those words, but to say it's such a privilege to be a part of this nation, uh, that it is one nation under God. And as long as we are indivisible, trying to work together for the common good, then no telling what God can do and putting God first. But we were thanking God for that privilege. Every time there's a sporting event, we see the national anthem is sung, and we talk about that, and, and it's a special time uh, for us to recognize that we are united in, in the privilege of having a nation where there can be all types of sporting events and other places do not have the privileges that we do here in America. As we think about today, naming the name of the Lord Jesus Christ what a great privilege it is to go forth in his name and, and to make an impact in this world that God wants us to make. Now, we know that we're supposed to do that. It's a pivotal time in the lives of these graduates when you launch out into the world and maybe some of the safety nets of home are, are, are kind of falling down and you have to make those decisions to be who you have been raised to be and hold on to the standards uh, whereby you know the Lord Jesus Christ would have you to go and, and to do and to be that person. It's the same standards that all of us have in that particular way that regardless of whether we're in church, we're around people or not, we are still accountable to the one who never sleeps nor slumbers. And he will hold us into account. Jesus has said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Uh, and so as we look at this passage of Scripture this morning, very briefly, we can see some things that the Apostle Peter has to say about impacting our world. There are some very great truths that he is reminding us of here if we are going to make an impact in our world, not just our graduates today, but for all of us. If we're going to make a difference, there are four things that we need to keep in mind. These truths that we, are, we call right out of these passage, this passage today and into our hearts and minds. First of all, if we're going to impact this world of ours, we're going to have to consider our calling. Now, he lays it down here in verse number 9 as he continues to talk about it because he says, listen, be reminded of your calling, who you are now as a citizen of the kingdom of God. You are a chosen generation. First thing that he has to say is you're a chosen generation. Israel, God's people, all throughout Scripture were used just to bring him honor, bring him glory to his name because they were particularly chosen to be that group of people who would bear his name. In Romans, 
chapter 9, verse 17, it says, For the Scripture says to, fa- to the Pharaoh, For this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And so there is a calling from the beginning. People still ask, well, why Israel? Of all the nations of the world, of all the nations and all the people that God could have used to be his people, why Israel? There's a simple answer. Because that's who God chose. That's just it. You can argue about it. You can like it or lump it, as we used to say. But Israel has been and still is God's chosen people. God has a plan, and God's not through with Israel yet as we look at eschatology and what will take place during that uh, seven-year tribulation period upon this earth as Israel will be born again in a day. But a chosen generation... But let's be reminded of this this as believers. The very fact that God chose us. John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. So we've been chosen. Chosen people to go out to bear fruit, fruit of the kingdom, fruit about our Savior. That is what we've been challenged to do. There's a second thing that he says there in verse 9, and that is that you're not only a chosen generation, you are a royal priesthood. Now, anytime you think about royal, you're thinking about something that's kingly, and yes, that's the word that is used there, a kingly type of descendant. Uh, priesthood was kingly in that no one except for Levi's descendants could be the priest and could go before God. But what he's saying of us is we believe in the priesthood of the believer that every one of us, that I have no greater access to God than you do. Have you ever thought about that? Well, Pastor Stan, I want you to pray for me because I know that your prayers get through and I know that you're going to be praying for me. Listen, my prayers are no more powerful than any other person who is surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the priesthood of the believer. You go through Jesus, he's the mediator, and so you have that great right. So he's, when he calls us a, a, this type of royal priesthood, literally we go before the king of kings here, and we're a priesthood before God. We are to pray before the law, for the lost before God, but we have direct access to God. There's another thing he says in verse 9 here, and that is that you are a holy nation, a multitude of people with the same nature. We as Americans are operating underneath a flag, one flag of the United States of America. We as believers are under the one nation, a kingly nation, a nation of believers that answers to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when he calls us this, again, it's just another descriptor that he's using here that we as a nation of people across the globe have been set apart to serve the living God. When he uses that in that way, a holy nation. As the Levites were set aside for service, we also are wholly set aside as a people to serve him. And then he moves into a fourth descriptor when he says his own special people. In the King James Version, you may like that particular because it says a peculiar people. We'd all agree with that. As Baptists, we can be quite peculiar at times. As believers, we can be peculiar. Our actions do not always match up as they should in a negative way, but hopefully in a positive way. Why do do those believers do that? Why do they meet together to worship? Why do they meet together to study God's Word? Why do they meet together to have prayer meeting? Why do they go on mission trips? Why do they give to this cause that other people can go into the mission field? Because we are a special people, a peculiar people. And so he's saying here, we need to consider our calling. We're going to impact our our world when we understand that we march to the beat of a different drum, that we're not as interested in being politically correct as we are scripturally correct. We are a special people called out before God. And so God's got a special plan and purpose for our lives. We will make an impact on this world when we, first of all, consider our calling. But second of all, we can make an impact on this world when we consider our commission. Now, in the last part of verse 9, he says that we are all of these descriptors, your calling are all of these things for this purpose. 
that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, this is it. We have one major purpose in life, and that is to sing praises and glorify God. That's our major purpose in life. If you are a child of God, your major purpose is to glorify God in all that you do. Now, there are many ways we can glorify God through the things that we do, but our major aim and purpose is to glorify God and we'll be glorifying and worshiping Him for all of eternity. You see, we have not just turned over a new leaf. We have not just decided to become Baptist. We not just decided to join up with a heavenly calling and, and, and uh, now we're following after Christ, but literally we have been born again. And see, when, he, when we use that terminology, we have to think about this commission here and where we have come from. You see, the last part of verse 9 there says, but he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When I was uh, on the school board a number of years ago, sometimes we would have... Um, teachers that were hired on lateral entry. Let's say they, they were in a bank and they were working in accounting and the person didn't have to go and get further schooling necessarily because they could go into the school system on a lateral entry. They could use their, the crafts they had. They could be a builder. They could have uh, workshop tools and they could, could begin to teach shop or whatever it is. They could use all those skills in those particular ways. It's called lateral entry. When we think of that particular thing, we have have to think of the fact that we are people who understand that we're not just here by the fact of who we are, that we're in the Bible Belt, the, the, the buckle of the Bible Belt, and that we grew up as Baptist and we grew up as Southern Baptist. And so, you know, it was a very easy transition for us. The truth of the matter is, is that every one of us are sinners separated from God. And he had to call us out of darkness and the bondage of sin. He said, well, I'm not that bad. Depends on who you're comparing yourself to. Next to the person beside of you, you may not be that bad. Or you could be worse. However, the comparison here is not between you and someone else. It's between the spotless Lamb of God. It's God's holy standard from his book. And so we have to understand that he has called us out of this darkness before we'll understand how we can possibly give him praise and we can sing forth his praises to the rest of the world who needs to know it. You see, the passage in Romans 5.10 says, For when we were without strength and in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5, 8, for God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners 2,000 years ago, Christ died for us. You mean he saw ahead of time 2,000 years and he saw, yes, he saw how dirty, rotten, low-down sinner that I am. And you're right there with me. Okay? See, whenever we begin to paint ourselves as some goody two-shoes, holier than thou, and we're better than those who aren't in church today, and we, we, we come from this heritage and all that. But we've forgotten the fact that Jesus left the splendor of heaven to come to this earth to die on an old rugged cross. If for nobody else, he did it for me. And he did it for you. But he did it for us because of who we are. We've got to consider our commission that why he has rescued us, no doubt he's rescued us, that we may then in turn tell other people, impact this world by telling other people of how good he has been to us. We proclaim his truth. He's pulled us out of that darkness, the last part of verse 9, that we may proclaim the praises of him. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says we are now ambassadors of Christ. We are the ones here on this earth speaking on behalf of one who is not here in that particular way, but we become his mouthpieces. We tell of his wants, his desires, his action. It's not about us, it's about him. So when he says we're ambassadors, we're speaking in someone else's behalf. 
Now we are ambassadors for Christ as though we were, he were pleading, God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So we've been given a directive and that is to share this glorious news and become a, be a part of the special family that he's placed us into. That great commission that we sometimes use in lump sum and lump form is something that we would all vote for and say, yes, we believe in that, but let me ask you, how's that working for you? How are we making disciples, and how are we individually doing that? We have one message and that one message is be reconciled to God that every person needs to know the Savior everywhere Peter went he shared the great fact as he wrote this epistle of the fact of where he was that he was a sinner he shared his testimony and of his conversion he Paul the Apostle Paul everywhere he went shared his testimony his conversion you know what that's what we're supposed to do that where we go, we're sharing our story. We don't have to share just Peter and Paul's story. We're to share our story. People can doubt you on a whole lot of things, but they can't doubt your story because you tell them what God has done in your life. So let me ask you, how's that going? How are you sharing that story, and have you picked out your one or maybe your two or three, those people that you are praying for, those people that you are not just praying for, not just identifying, but that you're looking for opportunities to be able to share the gospel? What steps have you taken beyond reaching them and beyond praying for them in order to say, I am going to try to stir up a conversation. I'm going to do whatever is necessary and we have to push ourselves in that. Can I share with you a little secret? And it's this. We have to discipline ourselves every week to be open to share the gospel. You say, well, that ought to come natural. It should come natural to us when we're living close to the Lord. And sometimes where you may be may be a little bit easier in that particular way. But see, I work in a Christian environment. It'll sink in in a little bit. I mean, it's like almost a total Christian environment besides some of the daycare parents that may come up who do not know Christ or KMO parents or some of the postmen or UPS people like that that we encounter on that area. So knowing that, we go beyond that and say when we go out and we may catch a bite to eat or we're going on this project or we're at the hospital, we have to intentionally look to be able to share the gospel. We have to discipline ourselves, not just because we are staff, but because we are the staff of this church. We should be looking to share the gospel and leading the charge for all of us. And that's our job, to say, you know, it becomes tougher. You say, well, boy, I changed places with you. I, I, I work in a hell hole. You know, some of you said that. You know, I changed places with you. It's, man, it's tough where I work. I might be the only believer. Praise God. What a white harvest field. You say, you don't know how hard that is. You don't know what I did before I ever went to my first church. You don't, I, you know, I could begin to tell you, but time won't allow. I'll tell it later. Remind me of that, Chris, and I'll tell it later. But listen, I know what it's like to be in those environments. I know what it is to be there. But you understand on the flip side of that, we have to push ourselves to do that or else we're just proclaiming something to you that we're not doing ourselves. So we have to push ourselves. We look for opportunities, but that's what we all have to do. Whether we're, we're in Ingalls or whether we're, we're here or there, or whatever, we're always trying to plant the seeds of the gospel. And so we have to consider our commission that he has given us that we're representatives of him. And we're a responsible witness. And I want you to look at a third thing quickly, and that is we will impact this world not only when we consider our calling and when we consider our commission that we've been saved out of darkness in, in order to, to sing praises to him and to show praises to this world, but we'll impact this world when we consider our condition. Now again, verse 10, he leaps back into this a little bit when he says, who once were not a people, but now are a people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. It's been said that we're just one beggar telling another beggar how to get bread. That's what it comes down to. 
You say, well, I don't have a big fiery testimony. Listen, I don't have a big fiery testimony either. But here's the great news about it. It doesn't have to be what you were saved from and tell how close to hell's flames you ever got. You tell that by the grace of God what he kept you from. That's a powerful testimony. And I praise God for that. That I didn't have to go through some of the things that some of the other people feel like that they had, that though they haven't gone through it yet, they have to go through it in order to have a great testimony. Why would you crucify Christ afresh and anew? Why would you want to go through that again? We're to offer to him praise, honor, glory, where we are, use the testimony he has, how God's changed our life in the way that he's kept us on path, and he still encourages us. We have to consider our condition where we once were, that others can have that same mercy and grace uh, uh, applied to their particular life. I don't have time to share with you the statistics I were going to share with you, but Al Mohler of our southeastern, uh, our, our uh, southern seminary, seminary um, has shared with us, and he wrote an article about statistics of why we're not making the greatest Baptist. I've said a few things about that before, but there are a lot of factors that go into this that I will share in the future and be able to give to you. But it talks about why we are where we are, and he does everything from birth rates, from those where, where families back a number of years ago were having almost four children uh, per family to now down to maybe two children per family, and how if we're raised in a Christian family, those children usually responded to the faith. Now that number is lower. And there's all kinds of things that go in there, eight or nine things that he shares in that particular article that really began to make sense for uh, someone of his brilliance as he begins to think about that and to use the statistics of all kinds kinds of things. But here's the, here's the bottom line. We become so fat and sassy as Southern Baptists, we just forgot what our calling is. We've forgotten what our commission is, and we've forgotten what our condition is, how he has saved us from, from, from a, a, a future in hell, and by his mercy we've been saved to impact this world, to take somebody else to heaven with us besides ourselves. His article really is the numbers don't add up. That's what he begins to talk about there and how we're at a position uh, that you have to go back uh, more than 30 years to get to where we were back then. So what have we not considered? Well, the gospel. You know, Romans 1.16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. What is it that we do with the gospel? We have to teach it. That's heralding it. That's proclaiming it. That's preaching it. That's witnessing it. That's sharing the gospel. Really, when it comes down to it, it's really not even rocket science. It's just simple that anybody here can do it. And any person who claims the name of Christ can tell what Christ did for you and what he wants to do for them. We talk about that love of God. The gospel is that which leads lost man to salvation. God's wonderful plan of love and grace that sent Jesus. It, what is our aim? Our aim is our hope, our desire, our goal, and that is that others come to know the Lord Jesus. We again, as I preached the other Sunday, have forgotten by and large that when this life is over with, there's only one of two alternatives, and neither one of them is the grave. You say, I thought we were going to die, and we'll, we'll have to go through the grave. Now, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the soul of man that never dies is going to be either in the presence of God or in the presence of torment in hell. That's the only two places that, that a person can go, but we like to, oh, I just don't like to think about that. I don't like, so we just choose to not talk about it and not think about it and just let people go there because that's the only alternative. And again, they're our family members, they're our friends, they're our neighbors, they're our work associates that we have forgotten about. We've got to consider it, our condition. Well, what is that gospel? We have to talk about, just answer four simple questions to anybody. First of all, the who. Who is God? And talk about who he is. Secondly, why are we in such a mess? Because we're sinners, and ever since Adam and Eve, that sin curse that's passed down to us. What did Christ do? He came from heaven to this earth 
to be born of a virgin in order to die as a man and yet God on Calvary's cross to redeem us from our sins. And then how can we get back to God? And that is to repent of our sin and receive Christ through faith and his sacrifice. And by that transaction, we become a child of God. Really, when it, everything is boiled down to it, that's taking the gospel to the people. So once we're convinced of the condition of mankind, then we want to be able to get the message out. And if we're going to impact our world, then we're going to have to do so because we're convinced of what our condition is and what the condition of every person who lives on planet Earth, 7 billion plus people, what their condition is. We've got to get it out. It's easy to just say, well, I can't I don't know them. I'll not see all them. Listen, then don't think about those you don't know. How about just thinking about everybody you know, everybody you run in contact with, everybody you have an opportunity to speak to. Let's just put it there. And that comes a whole lot more home to us in, in many ways of where we ought to be. We also then have to consider our conduct. He ends up in verses 11 and 12 talking about our own individual conduct. He speaks of how we live as believers. Uh, do you know there ought to be something distinctive about the way we live versus the way the world lives? You know that, right? That there ought to be something different about us and the rest of the world. Here's the main problem with evangelicals. We look like the rest of the world. We strive to want to be like them so that we don't stand out. And you don't want to stand out, you know, for, for mercy. So, I mean, I didn't come here and here today and have one leg just completely sawed off of these suit pants just to look different. We're not trying to look different in that way, but people ought to be able to look and say there's something different about that person. There's something different about the way they carry themselves. There's something different about the way they speak to other people. There's something different about this and this and this and this about them. And then they began to see some of our actions, and they can say, tell me what it is. What makes you be like you are? What makes you the person that you are? And we've got it laid wide open for us when that takes place. You see, the difference is this. Too many times the world calls our bluff, and this is what they say. Why would I need to be a Christian? My life's as good as anybody who goes to church. I'm just like them. Matter of fact, let me tell you about my neighbor. Let me tell you about, you know, this Christian and that Christian. Let me tell you what they do and what they don't do. And listen, they'll tell you all day long. And it's an indictment. And we want to look so much like the rest of the world as if we, we need to be like them in order to get the message across. Now, I'm not saying be holier than thou, but they ought to be something about our standards. They were for Jesus, they were for his disciples, and they should be for us. But he says we're strangers, we're pilgrims here. Understanding, we, we spend way too much time thinking that we're going to spend the rest of our life down here and not on the other side. We've become so, so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good. And, and we're not thinking about the fact that, look, I'm older than I've ever been, I'm getting closer to heaven than I've ever been, and I need to make sure that I'm trying to take as many people with me as I possibly can. We're just strangers and pilgrims passing through. Too many of us have made our home here on this side rather than saying it's just a temporary structure. I'm actually heading to the other side. And then he goes further and he starts meddling a little bit and he says, so abstain from fleshly lust. What's to abstain? It's to hold back. All kinds of controversies. What can a Christian do? What should they do? Shouldn't they do? Uh, across even our own convention, alcohol becomes a big subject of what is allowable and what's not allowable and who should do this and that and the other. Again, you know, we should not be looking how close we can get to the edge without falling off. We ought to be able to say that there's something different about who we are. We're not looking for liberty's sake. Paul said, you got a liberty to do a lot of things, but you don't want to do it because you don't want to become a stumbling block to a lot of people. And by the way, no alcoholic ever, ever said, I want to be an alcoholic. They just started with that first drink. And can I share with you that while 
8% of Americans, 12 and over, are addicted to illicit drugs. And that we see those commercials on, on TV when it talks about that egg in the frying pan and this is your brain on drugs and it's frying. Can I share with you that 34% of those 12 and older are addicted to alcohol and all kinds of crimes that go along with it and all the despair. So let me ask you, why would we want to do that? Why would we even want to get that close to that? just for the liberty to say, I have a privilege, I have a liberty to do something. Who is it we're offending along the way? That would be like me going to the Grand Canyon again saying, you know, there's a lot of people that's fallen off this year, but I think I'm just going to get on the edge and I'm just going to see how close I can get without falling off. Why would we want to get that close? There ought to be something different about our lives. You say, well, Jesus had a lot to say, but he didn't say a lot about that. And by the way, you know, he talked about wine. Listen, we're not getting into a cultural, traditional thing about what the quality of the word wine was then versus what it is today. But the Bible has plenty of things to say about that. But with the watching world saying, wow, they do everything I do. Wow, I'm right behind them in the grocery store. They're buying a lottery ticket just like I am. Wow, they're going into Harris Cherokee just like I go in there. What is different about our life? We, listen, we've got to look different. If we've got someone that has called us to live straight and narrow, and by the way, here's still something that's in vogue, though people don't think it is. Be ye holy, even as I, your Lord God, am holy. He's called us to that. That's not easy. That's not a holier than thou but it is not trying to stay down in the gutter and see how close I can look like everybody else around me. It's saying I need to march to the beat of a different drum. A watching world is looking, and we see the results of all kinds of actions that the rest of the world is involved with. And then he says this, having your conduct honorable among Gentiles as the world watches. Jesus said it this way. He said, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your fathers in heaven. Not that they may see that you're involved in the same muckety-muck that they're involved with. They see your good works and they'll glorify your Father who is in heaven. We have been called to be a thermostat and not a thermometer. The thermometer lists the, what the temperature is in the room. A thermostat sets the temperature. It's time for God's people just to once again stand up and say there, there needs to be something clear-cut different about who we are and the message that we proclaim and actually proclaim that type of message. Back in 1805, there was Indian chief that uh, was meeting in upstate New York one summer. And he was to listen to a council at Buffalo Creek from the Christian Message Society and, and, or the Boston Missionary Society, Mr. Cram. And after the sermon, the response was given by Red Jacket, one of the leading chiefs. Among other things, this is what the chief said. Brother, we're told that you've been preaching to white people in this place. These people are our neighbors. We are acquainted with them. We will wait a little while and see what effect your preaching has upon them. And if we find it does them good, makes them honest and less deposed to cheat Indians, we will then consider again what you have to say. Could it be we're not willing to live that type of upright life because it puts too much pressure on us? And as long as people don't know where we stand, we can just kind of flow along with the rest of the water of this world and we see how that's getting us here you see it can be in the small things we're an advertisement for Christianity everywhere we go by what we do or don't do some of you will go out to eat in just a little bit and you're gonna have an opportunity to say the blessing over your food it's a small thing but you know that speaks I'm not talking about praying for the whole restaurant loud enough for the whole restaurant to hear but you have an opportunity. Do you know how many people are watching that? 
And by the way, you have another opportunity to be a witness at the end because you can give what a real tip is at the end. Instead of having them talk about you later, them Christians, if they'd give us a real tip rather than throwing down a dollar. Hello? Hey, listen, I know, gone to meddling a little bit, but that's what I'm talking about. That's, that's just being honest. You say, well, they didn't come back and bring me in a refill but twice. <laughs> Maybe only once. They don't deserve it. For God's grace, we didn't deserve Calvary. And Jesus came anyway. Hey, you know, I'm just saying, we got to live above the standard. Sometimes you may feel uh, real benevolent. And give more, and you know, you know, mercy can't be lacking. I mean, even Barney and Andy both put down a quarter on the counter. <laughs> they entertained going and getting it back, and then they said, "No, she's got four children; she needs it." <laughs> you, you see, I'm just saying this is how we do that. Not because it was the best service in the world, but we could be a better representative of Him if we just do the right thing. Just, just do the right thing. Don't, don't, they don't wait. Just do the right thing. I sat in this line for 15 minutes. This car comes buzzing by me, wanting to get in my line. It's all you can do. do. Just do the right thing. Maybe they're not from these parts. <laughs> Small things. And let me say this, use every opportunity to brag on Jesus. Every opportunity. They'll ask you at the checkout counter, how's your day going? And sometimes you'll get that Christian. Man, it's going so great. I, I am so blessed. Oh, yes, I'm blessed too, they'll say. Just get into a hallelujah meeting right there. <laughs> now, you didn't do that to, br to bring that out. But sometimes that's the response. Sometimes it's just nothing. Sometimes it gets a person thinking, and just saying little things like I'm blessed, better than I deserve, bragging on Jesus, bragging on God are things that we can do. Sometimes they will accept, sometimes they will reject, and sometimes the message just has to sink in. But there's three things we've got to possess if we're going to impact the world quickly. A motivated heart. That heart has to be motivated. I'm saved, they're lost, what am I going to do? You're going to stand on the shore while they're drowning? You're, you're not going to get involved in that situation when you see somebody beating somebody up and you're not going to step in? A motivated heart. We've also got to be equipped with the gospel, not knowing it all, but knowing enough to be able to share our faith and our testimony. And then we've got to be available to share. Our prayer every day should be, Oh God, let me be a lighthouse for you this day. And let me share with those who come across my path. Let me look for the opportunities because I know they're there. And to take advantage of them when they come. On the night that the Titanic went down, there were two ships that were not very far off. The Carpathia was only 58 miles to the southeast. There was also the California that was only... 20 miles to the north. That night, there were two captains who made different choices of those ships. For the Carpathia, when he heard the water, he heard the, uh, he heard the warning, he, 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 he heard that there was an SOS, he saw the flares, he chose to put it down and go for it. All engines full speed, and they went through the ice fields to get there. At one time, they said that the red needle had pegged out and he put his cap over it so they couldn't see how hot the engines really were. He had said, prepare the blankets, prepare hot meals, we'll take on survivors. And they got there three hours after it went down, but that was as fast as they could do it. The California, on the other hand, the captain had made a decision that night. He had heard all he wanted to hear about iceberg warnings that even came from the Titanic. And so he said, shut off that radio. And he shut off the radio. 
He saw the flares, but he thought maybe they were just company flares from one ship to another that were saying something, and he chose to go off to sleep until finally he heard the news and it was way too late. One of these captains was declared a hero because he got there and 700 were saved, other bodies floating in the water. When the other ship finally arrived very, very late, nothing but floating bodies in the water. And he was vilified as as the villain. He was always looked to, projected in that particular way. So let me ask you this. You say, what has that got to do with anything? When it comes to reaching others, will you choose to be a hero for God or will you choose to be the villain? Will you choose to get involved, to do what you can? I can't save everybody, no, and they couldn't either but you can save one. Jude says, snatching some out of the fire. We can do something. When we go forth to impact the world, it's one person at a time. That's what Who's Your One's all about. It's just one person at a time. In the process, somebody else may come along, always open to that. But how is God going to do that through your life? Which of these captains would you want to be as a believer? One who did everything they could to try to preserve life, to save life, to see people one day in heaven, or to not care. You see, that's when it comes down to us. Will we impact our world? That's the scripture that he gives to us. We're to be making a difference. Not living our lives like everybody else does, but willing to say, let's live differently, let's share the message that's eternal, and let's see some come to know Christ. Would you bow your heads? And across this place today, I hope you've made this decision to impact your world. This decision to impact your world. And perhaps today, as you make this decision, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. There's been too many times that I've not done something, but I'm going to do something for the cause of Christ. It's a great time to follow through with that decision. Some of you may want to bend a knee here at the altar. But God, I want to I impact. I, I want to... I want to try to be a part of rescuing someone else, not just physically but spiritually, for the rest of their life. How about it in your life today? Father, in Jesus' name, you know every person here, every heart, every decision. Lord, I know that our graduates want to go forth and impact this world, but Lord, the truth is every person in this place, we're going to impact it. And we're going to be a positive or a negative example. And to be in the middle is just not good enough because no one ever was pointed to heaven by us staying in the middle. So, Lord, we've got a a choice to make. We've got to choose to impact our world. God, would you use us like never before? And I'm praying for every person here that they would make that decision. Other decisions that need to be made today, Lord, be glad to pray with them. For some, the most important decision to repent of their sins, trust Christ to be their Savior and become a part of the family of God. Oh God, would this be the day? The Apostle Peter has reminded us of the great truth that each of us have been given a commission, a commission that is the great commission. It goes along with that is the fact that we're to consider and to think about our conduct in this world and how we carry ourselves and how we impact others in this life. It's not all about us. It's not all about a me theology. It's about reaching others according to the commands of Christ. And so if I ask you the question today, how are you impacting others, how could you answer that? Well, it could be that you're not impacting others because you yourself have never come to a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to ask you right now, if you've never done that, you've never asked him to forgive your sin, to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior, then I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. And then as we continue our prayer today, others who want to be an impact in this world, I pray that they will pray along as well. But let's pray together at this time. Father, thank you for those who have been watching the broadcast today and your Holy Spirit has convicted hearts and lives in the work that only you can do. And I thank you today that some want to be an impact in this world. They want to make a difference, but it starts with a personal relationship with you as it did with the Apostle Paul, as it did with the Apostle Peter. Lord, it does with all people. 
And so today, for those who have never prayed to receive Christ as Savior, I pray right now you would give them the strength to pray a prayer to you much like this by faith. Dear God, I realize that I am a sinner, and I know that I don't deserve to go to heaven but to hell. But Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sin and to come into my life. I trust that Jesus died for me on the cross And I want him to be my Savior and Lord. Give me the strength to live for him. And Father, thank you for those who are beginning this journey now, now called the children of God. And Lord, you've given us all a charge, and that is to make an impact in this world through our conduct, through our character, through our commission that we have been given, that we are to be the children of God. You've placed a call upon our life. And Lord, may we never push that aside in order to have our own agenda. I pray that today, believers, as we have watched, as we have seen what you have said to us, I pray we'd be ready to respond and be willing to make an impact for however many days that you give us in the future, whether it be days or weeks or months or years or decades, Lord, that we will be willing to make an impact for you. This day, Lord, I pray that we will be willing to go out and each day to make an impact upon those that we meet in this world. We know we have the answer. Now, Lord, give us the boldness and the power to be able to share it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we think about sharing that impact, that's what God's given us a commission to do. And by the way, it's not just to go overseas, but the great commission is that as you are going, you are to make disciples. And so as we go out of this place, as we go out of our homes, as we go out of our workplaces, God's given us a commission that we're to make disciples. I hope you're going to be about that this week. My prayer is that you'll have a good and a godly week until we meet again. If you would like to help support ministry at West Asheville Baptist Church, you can do so by visiting our website, westashevillebaptist.org, to give online, or by calling the church office at 828-253-9824.